Um, good evening. It is almost evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your own voyages to coffee and return. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Fiona Shaw uh, here for a conversation about her work, her approach to being an artist. Um, I think, in a way, that the, the theme of Voyage and Return applies very well to Fiona's career, uh, both literally in the voyage she took from her native Cork to Rada in London in the 1980s to train as an actor. And we've obviously just heard from Tom about his experience as an Irish actor at Rada, so it might be interesting to revisit that. Um, but I think that that theme also runs through the roles that she has played throughout her career as an actor. Um, so many of the characters that she's played have kind of grappled with the condition of exile in one way or another, either literally in Medea, the witch, the foreigner, but also perhaps more metaphorically in the state of being an outsider. Um, we see that in Hedda Gabler, we see it in Richard II, we see it in May in Footfalls. Um, and I think that sense of, of figures that stand on the border, figures who are on a cusp of some description or another, really uh, are kind of characteristic of the approach that Fiona has taken to those roles. Um, we think of her performance as a lecturer in 1988 at the RSC, in which the limits of the self really were being investigated and staged, and perhaps also the limits of acting, of what acting can be. And I think that was also true in Mother Courage at the National Theatre in 2009, where the, the final image of this woman alone with her cart almost moved from Brecht to Beckett, that sense of a, a figure who's been reduced really to a mere self, a, 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 you know, the, the most basic self. Um, and also that theme of return, well, we can always think of theatre as a sort of revenant in the ways that it repeats texts over many thousands of years, revisiting them. And there's a sense in Fiona's commitment to a really rigorous investigation of the Western theatre canon, moving from the Greeks to Shakespeare to the Europeans, Ibsen, Brecht, Beckett, a real sense of accessing other times and places, while at the same time also being resolutely modern, resolutely present, because of course theatre always is present, it's always happening in real time. And I think that sense of borders is also played out perhaps in the ways in which Fiona moves through different kinds of theatrical traditions, from the great classical tradition of the British stage to the literary traditions of the Irish stage, um, to, to the commercial traditions actually of the American stage, perhaps the New York stage. Um, and what's fascinating is her more recent engagement with Irish texts and Irish writers, not in Ireland, but abroad, so in London and in New York, while grappling with the Europeans, Ibsen, and also Euripides in Ireland. Um, and finally, I think that sense of borders, of, of standing on the cusp, also applies to her investigation of space in performance. In her work with Deborah Warner, the theatre director, um, in their site-specific performances of The Wasteland, and also a recent um, project for the Cultural Olympiad called Peace Camp, which involved recording and staging poems in tents in different parts of the UK. Um, and I think that interest in, in extending the kinds of spaces the performance might take place in also is an, it leads to a kind of an interest in working with other kinds of literary forms, so working with poetry in the wasteland and also the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which is one of Fiona's next projects. But I'm also mindful that she has come to us from an extraordinarily busy time, working not as a performer, but as a director in opera. And I wonder, Fiona, should we start by just you telling us what you did last week? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I, 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 well, thank you very much. I, I, I just want to say that I, I'm thinking of... Um, Beckett has those wonderful lines in Happy Days where Winnie says, Winnie, you are changeless because there's never any difference between one fraction of a second and the next. <laughs> and uh, just before me, just among this group, there are two men that I've just seen, Niall McMonagall and Dennis Staunton, who I've known for 35 years. So I think there is a difference between one fraction of a second and the next. <laughs> And I feel my voyage and return are just about well-timed. <laughs> um, what I did last week, okay. Um, I had a busy week last week uh, because um, I am directing uh, the opera, The Rape of Lucretia. There's something making it. These were lovely. Um, the Rape of Lucretia at uh, Glyndebourne. Uh, 
which is down in the middle of Sussex, which is a beautiful place. And every morning I go out and I run in the hills and I pass foxes. And the other day I passed a rabbit who didn't even run away because I was running so slowly. It just looked at me, <laughs> <laughs> just looked at me like, well, is she moving? You know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's a fantastic opera, Benjamin Britten opera, and a very English opera, I suppose, for that sake, reason. I mean, it's very much about England. Um, but at the same time, I had recently stood in for my friend Deborah Warner, who was ill, uh, at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, where she was directing the opening season production of Eugene Onegin um, with Anna Netrebko. And so I foolishly said that I would stand in and then found that I was doing two operas at the same time. So last week, I was in Glyndebourne directing until Thursday evening, and then I took a flight to New York, uh, and I got in at about midnight, and I got up in the morning, and I directed Eugene Onegin on, on the Friday, uh, the stage and, and orchestra with Gergiev, the conductor, and 88 chorus members, and then I got on a plane that evening. And I flew back to Glyndebourne, and I was directing back at Glyndebourne at nine o'clock the following morning. I thought that was—I didn't know whether it was Christmas or Thursday. I really was upset. So, but that's not a typical week, I have to say. That's nice to know. It doesn't happen all the time. Okay. Um, can you tell us a bit about the difference between being a performer and a director, and also maybe the difference between working in theatre and working in opera? Um, because you're sort of shifting mode in two ways, really, aren't you? Well, it's not that I've jumped ship, but I—I I spent. Uh, most of my 30s in a rehearsal room and I the rest of the time I spent on the stage but I spent a lot of time in rehearsal rooms because these big classical plays take a huge amount of time and they take you know sometimes you're six or seven or eight weeks in a rehearsal room and then you perform them and sometimes if they're taken abroad you have to travel with them and sometimes people get sick or somebody has a baby and you have to re-rehearse them and you really do become a sort of um, an automaton, uh, spending just unbelievable amounts of time in rehearsal rooms. And so when I was in my 40s, I thought I wasn't going to spend all of my life in a rehearsal room. So instead, I decided to be in a rehearsal room in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, invited by the English National Opera, actually, just before I was 50, to direct Riders of the Sea, which was... Um, uh, to celebrate Vaughan Williams' centenary. So my friend Dorothy Cross from uh, Ireland uh, had done some beautiful videos to do with seas. So I asked Dorothy to do the videos and Tom Pye, a designer who I've worked with a lot, to do the sets. And I embarked on this uh, opera. Uh, and it was such a fantastic experience to the scale of it. I was, became immediately addicted to the scale of the potential of it. And I found the opera singers were quite good actors and that the rhythm of the evening was held in the music rather than in theatre, which is a very difficult thing to get right in the theatre, which is that the evening is carried by the rhythm of the actors. And if the actors are mixed in ability, it's terribly hard to get the rhythm correct because somebody holds it. They don't know they're holding it, but they, they do. And actually just vis-a-vis -vis that, when, when we were doing Medea, at its best, every evening we would have um, the timings of the show and it used to come in within two seconds of itself. Yet it seemed improvised, but in fact, it was everybody was absolutely on the beat of it. And I think when you get the shows right down to that, and theatre often can sprawl and things can be 20 minutes <laughs> longer than they should be, um, it's, it's very exciting. But in the opera, that is held absolutely by the tempi of the conductor. So I like that. Hmm. Um, I wonder, actually, could we hold on to that um, conversation about process and maybe go right back to Electra in 1988 at the RSC, which I realise, given the week you've had, maybe hard to remember. Um, Some people weren't even born. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was an extraordinary performance, which really seemed to remap your career from a kind of Shakespeare comedy route to um, a sense of you actually as a, as a tragic actor, as an actor of tragic roles. And also it was your first collaboration with Deborah Warner. And it was a, a, a performance that really seemed to shock critics in how differently you appeared on stage, this sort of, um, as I say, staging the limits of the self, staging limits of acting perhaps. And I wonder if you could just talk about what it took to prepare for that role. What, what, what is it to be in the rehearsal room to play a role like Electra? What do you do? Well, I doubt many people here saw that, but some of you may have. Um, but it, it, 
Electra, as you know, is, is part of the Oristia, and Electra is the forgotten daughter, really, of uh, Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, and she doesn't get on with her mother very well because she's decided to side with her father because she saw her father being murdered by her mother uh, when, when uh, he came back from the war, and so she, she fights with her mother about this, and she and her mother defends herself by saying, well, I wouldn't have done that except that your father killed your sister in order to get a wind to go to Aulis to fight the Trojan War and on and on and on. And uh, it's very much a sidecar story. It's absolutely, she's very unimportant, Electra. And I think that makes her very interesting. She's just, you know, her brother is Orestes. She's waiting for Orestes to come back. Uh, somebody says, I've got to tell you bad news, Orestes is dead, and she goes a bit bonkers. And then this boy turns up and says, I am Orestes. So she discovers that her dead brother is in fact alive. So it's full of unspeakable kind of juxtapositions to, to perform. And very often, uh, or certainly in the 80s um, and probably into the 90s, a lot of very difficult theatre work was done in it with a stylization. Uh, you, you found a way, which was a fair enough way of saying, this thing is too hard to do. So let's find a music that we can hide behind, or a dance. I mean, the, the cartoucherie in Paris had done fantastic work. I remember a wonderful production of uh, Iphigenia at Aulus, when Iphigenia was being taken to be sacrificed, and her mother, Clytemnestra, was trying to stop her. And these dancers just came in and mowed the mother down. I mean, the mother was absolutely trampled on by the dancers. And so often this, you need to break beyond the realism of the play to try and allow, which is what opera does, of course, or song, because you literally can't speak the thing. It's unspeakable. And so it has to be raised up. And I think all we were trying to do with Electra was to not do that, not mm -hmm. hide behind a stylization, but to see if it could actually happen. And the only way we could do that was to work very hard <laughs> and um, get very upset doing it. So there was a very good group of people, some of whom gave up acting afterwards, actually. Um, <laughs> some may have said I should have. Um, some did. Uh, about three of them got pregnant within a year and just ran away. Um, and uh, some of them couldn't stand it. One girl told me she took a year and a half to get over it at all. Um, and it just was very heavy going. But we were young and strong. And I, the only tragedy that had been in my life at all, uh, being brought up in Cork, there is no tragedy in Cork. But, <laughs> <laughs> but my poor brother had been killed in a car accident. And I, it was the first play that I felt I understood in the real world something of what a play was. Up to that point, I just thought plays were excuses for me to show off. And I think that's mainly what I did. I, I was at the RSC and I played Portia and Beatrice and, you know, Celia. And I, I just had a marvelous time playing these Shakespeare heroines. But that's largely what they were. Once you got onto the sort of stallion thoroughbred of, of, uh, of the rhythm of the iambic pentameter, there's nothing you can't do. You know, you can just be very funny and witty and you can do anything you like with it. So I, I had so enjoyed learning to play the scales, as it were, on, on those Shakespeare heroines that uh, it, I, I honestly didn't realize the plays were about real things until then. <laughs> um, that show toured to Derry as part of, uh, of, as part of a kind of cross-community theater festival and was very controversial in advance, wasn't it, that the community felt that the Royal Shakespeare Company coming to Derry was politically dubious. There was an extraordinary response to that performance in Derry. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, <clears throat> there was an extraordinary... Uh, the, the play came to Derry as part of the Derry Festival. And it was indeed the Royal Shakespeare Company, but I, I really think these titles are uh, merely... It could have been called the Municipal Shakespeare Company. You know, it just happens to be called the Royal Shakespeare Company because it has a, a little crest on it. The Queen very rarely goes to the Royal Shakespeare Company, <laughs> nor any other member of the royal family. And indeed, the government never go, notably, ever. <laughs> they just, we have the most un going government in England ever. It's incredible. Whereas m many more government members, I think, do go to the theatre here. Um, so it did go to Derry, and at that time there had been a terrible bomb where uh, some children indeed had been killed in a betting office and that week. And so it was just as it happened, uh, we arrived in that week. And I played Electra and John Lynch, who was from very nearby, um, up there, he came, he played Orestes, the brother. 
So it was amazing having these lines by Orestes spoken to Aegisthus, who was played by an African actor, um, where he said, you know, uh, Aegisthus says to him, you killed, you're going to kill your mother, and now you want to kill me, and my son will kill you, and on it goes. And this is, this is the end of the play. In fact, Electra's just gone a bit mad by then. She's not, doing any, she's not saying anything important at all. Uh, and at the end of the play, uh, we finished the play, and the audience were silent, and they didn't clap. And this is really unusual, but I have subsequently heard of it happening elsewhere. Mm. They were absolutely silent. They couldn't move, they didn't move, and they didn't clap, and they were right. You couldn't clap in that week a play that was about permanent revenge or the impossibility of revenge. And so at the end of the very short curtain call, <laughs> I think I said, if anybody wanted to stay behind to ask questions, they could. And so we went off and we got washed out of our blood and our gore. And we returned and people began a huge discussion in the audience. And it was so exciting a thing because suddenly the theatre itself, which you know often can be the most irrelevant experience for people, which is why it fights for its audiences often. It can be irrelevant, nonsensical, not necessary. Um, overtaken by film, overtaken by the internet, lots of things, uh, suddenly it seemed to matter. Um, of course, we didn't do the last play of the Aristide where Athena would have come down and said, we must stop all this uh, killing and we must come up with some better solution, which is called the law, I suppose. Um, and people began a huge discussion. And at that time, Mary Holland, who was working for the Irish Times, she came or from the Observer she was working for, and she immediately came the following day to experience the same thing again. And she wrote a huge article about it, and it was really, it caused, in that way, for a moment, it did seem that our little scratchings in this sports hall in Derry had some significance for a second. Mm. I suppose that leads to the question we were asking earlier, maybe, which is, what on earth do you think you're doing as an actor? So, <laughs> and maybe that moment is one of the answers, but I'm wondering about those characters, those roles like Electra, like Mother Courage, perhaps like May, um, where there does seem to be some investigation of, of what it is to be a self, to be a person, um, and what the limits of that might be. And I'm wondering as an actor what you think it is you're doing. What is being an actor? Some very rude answers to that, isn't <laughs> it? Um, uh, <coughs> Self-indulgence, spoiled, irresponsible. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I suppose, Actors, their roots are in their childhood. You know, I, I think I, I uh, always loved performing poems, and I'm not sure that my life genuinely is anything beyond an extension of performing in the drawing room at home. I, I fundamentally think that's what it is. I think it is. So anything that is grander in its scale or investigation has been the challenge of meeting incredibly good writers or writing that demands that you uh, pitch however your small provincial self against and see if you hang on through the storm of uh, excuses to a kind of honesty that weirdly something can eventually transform and the thing, it sort of, it ennobles the performer who is a sinner really. It is like that. It is a kind of purification at its best. And if that ends up in Sue's corner, I'm going to shoot myself. Um, it's sort of, you're surprised, but I think musicians who are playing great music have the same experience. You're, you're playing something greater than your own experience. Um, for me, I think, for my voyage, it's a voyage uh, not away from my roots, but a voyage to the infinite amounts of landscape that exists within all our imaginations. And, Really, all writing is, is the boat that you can sail to another place in. And um, I've had a marvellous time sailing to these places and staying a short time and leaving. You know, that's mm. the great thing, because the, the theatre is a chance to flirt with danger and sometimes with morality and politics and lots of things. But you, in the end, you go home and you have a glass of red wine and you say, that was marvellous. <laughs> I might just catch Newsnight. I mean, in yeah. the end, uh, there's no harm done. It's, it's, in that way, it's childhood. It's playing. And um, going back to your metaphor of the musician, obviously, 
when we look at a musician, we, we see the instrument. And it's easier to understand technique when it comes to musicians because it's exteriorized. With actors, it's much harder to understand what technique is. And I wonder if we could actually go back to before a lecture, to go back to RADA, and if you could tell us a little bit about what, what is training as an actor, what does technique mean to you? How does it work? Technique is everything. <laughs> and there was a terrible moment when I was about to be trained, um, when a lot of my Irish student colleagues would say, you're going to lose all your individuality. Mm. You're going to throw away your natural gifts. You're going to, um, you know, not know yourself at the other end. You're going to become a robot. This is nonsense. And um, what you learn is that in the essence of language, whatever it is, there is a rule that is a play no matter who you are. So if you're American, I said this in a lot of places, but if you're American, you'll head towards the noun. You can't help it you'll say tea, coffee, money, jam, war, um, <laughs> Afghanistan. They, they just love nouns. And <laughs> they love cars, they love houses, they love money. Money is a big, big, big noun. Um, uh, but they're, they're, this tendency may be because they came from countries where their language was not English, and when they got there, there wasn't the time to have the refinement of uh, the decadent European English, which was, I wonder, could I possibly bother you for a little tiny tinkery? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, um, well, that's so kind, thank you so much. Or, or a marvellous thing, I, I won't say who it is, but th there's people I know, and they say, you simply must come for dinner. <laughs> and that means never. Yeah. <laughs> You know. <laughs> yeah. They said it to me the other day, and I was hysterical. Yeah. I thought, I, I know. I <laughs> say, what day? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you what you you know what you learn in in that, or or you know English people speak in five beats, or they began to shortly after Chaucer, where they had a tendency towards four or three, because the influence of France was so strong on the English language and Latin. But when they began to breathe roughly, they began to say things, you know, like, I wonder, would you like a cup of tea? And that is the iambic pentameter. It's just there. Ti -ti 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 to be or not to be, that is the question. All the same lines. So once you learn that the length of a breath, I wonder, would you like a cup of tea, or to be or not to be, that is the question, is in fact the length of a breath. It's not the length of a thought. A thought could be longer. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the things in errors of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of stuff. You could go on a bit, but you could always be going to tum ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum No longer mourn for me when I am dead then you shall hear the surly, sullen bell cry out that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. It just goes on. Now, the really exciting thing is that obviously if you went around talking like that, you'd bore a lot of your friends. <laughs> <laughs> so life would get a bit dull because actually that rhythm is the rhythm of the heartbeat beating gently underneath the pulse of our conversation. Life only gets interesting when that's contradicted. So Shakespeare very cleverly puts in the contradiction. Sometimes he hides a word at the beginning of Macbeth. The witches, who incidentally don't speak in the iambic pentameter because they're witches, they speak in an inverted iambic pentameter. Instead of going ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum, they go tum ti tum ti tum ti. That's clever. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly? That's not. I've never played the witches, but this is what they're like. When the hurly burns. I wouldn't do it like this except at home. You know? When the bar when the hurly bird is done, when the battle's lost of sun, one, that will be your set of sun, where the place upon the pleath, there to meet with Macbeth, fair is foul and foul is fair, hovers of the fog and filthy air. Now, what's interesting about that is that there's one word that doesn't scan even within this uh, reversed iambic, and that's the name Macbeth. So that's a key. That usually means if the thing doesn't scan, 
you're meant to not skip over it, but put much more air around it. There to meet with, doesn't scan, so jump out of the iambic, Macbeth. Fair is foul and foul is fair, how was the fuck it could be And then the audience know where they are. Now, they're not ticking off the iambic on a card sheet, hopefully, <laughs> or reading their programs, but they are, but the rhythm is the rhythm of the unconscious. So an actor isn't just speaking or pervading, you know, purveying a sort of information to you about the character. They're actually catching the rhythm at the back of your mind and twisting it. Now, that's the English. The Irish are a peculiar case because they speak inheritedly with the English iambic pentameter because it's been beaten into them and they have a minor chord in the middle of it. <laughs> so they say things like, I wonder would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> their tendency is to go down because they don't want to put their head above a parapet. <laughs> so that's fine, you know, to be or not to be, that's the question. <laughs> You see me, Lord Bassanio, as I am, such as I am. <laughs> There's a sort of self-mocking, self-disregard just built in to the sound of the language. And that can be of great use, use, you know, if you want to use it. But probably, if you're speaking to 2,000 people, it won't serve you entirely. And this is why, um, you know, there's a wonderful speech, um, uh, Rosalind has it. Uh, why, I pray you, who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What, though you have no beauty, as by my faith? So you could go like this in Cork. <laughs> <laughs> so why, I pray you, who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once? <laughs> and all at once over the wretched, what? <laughs> Do you have no beauty? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm going back 35 years. I can see Dennis <laughs> You, you could, you'd really have a, a thunderous applause of an audience in about one square mile of the valley of County Cork, where the rhythm of Cork would be imbued into this iambic pentameter, and you'd come out with a kind of mess, because it would speak very well locally, but it would not speak nationally or internationally. And that is why I think technique is important, not that you get rid of your own native rhythms, but that you begin to notice them. I mean, the French, you see, on the other hand, the French won't even speak in iambic. They speak in four beats, which is very annoying. So they tend to say, to be or not to be you. <laughs> My sister annoys like this, she's French. She goes, you know, I wonder, would you like a <laughs> cup of tea? <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's technique, is just knowing what is the language doing. You don't have to go, you know, it's not very studious, by the way, you don't have to go home and underline this, but it's worth knowing. And so, when people are acting, you're not also going to stay on that ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum because, as I say, it would be boring. So you have to put the skates on. But the really nice thing to do is you can also slow right down and very like the tempo in music is that you can, where you've expanded here, you must speed up over here and expand again there. And then the whole thing will have a sort of roundedness. And in one way, the amazing thing about Shakespeare's writing is that when it begins at the beginning of a, of a play, at best, with that, with that sort of mm, metronome that is, is doing whatever you want it to do, but is there behind, that the thing is all one and you get to the end of the play and the audience have been through a journey, not because they have listened to just everything you've said, but because the rhythm is the key to the unconscious of the play and the rhythm is the key to the unconscious of the audience. And that's very powerful. It makes the experience for the audience better and the experience for the actor better. Um, so I think that is what technique is, is just hearing difference. In the same way as you, if you're learning painting, you go and look at a lot of paintings and you start to see how the structure of the painting works. Hmm. Um, I suppose that leads to a question around working with 
different texts from different places. And it is interesting, I think, that the, the Irish writers you've worked with, you've performed usually outside of Ireland. So you've worked in London and, and the States with writers like Marina Carr or Colm Tobin, or indeed Beckett, although he's an interesting case as to whether indeed he's Irish. Um, and then, of course, you've worked with the, the Europeans. I think he is. <laughs> I think he is. But, he, but whether he identified as Irish, you know, he has his own kind of ambivalency there, I think. But um, does it matter that they're Irish? Does it matter that those writers are Irish? Or does it depend on the play? It matter in what sense? If for you, when you're preparing, when you're working with those roles, does their Irishness figure in the ways that you're grappling with those texts? Um, well, Marina Carr is just a delightful person. I mean, just incredible person. Um, in a funny way, she has got a weird inherited element of Shakespeare. Mm. She's just unstoppable. You know, there are fantastic things. I won't quote them now, but there's one of the things in Shakespeare that, you know, it, within three sentences, uh, one sentence, Shakespeare will say something like, when somebody hears that her father's dead, she says, dead on my life. And Marina plays with that sort of thing all the time, uh, turning things upside down in an instant. And she also, you know, she wrote a version of Fedra. It was absolutely marvelous. We read it in, um, in a university in America in which she had the Minotaur. In fact, she rewrote the play and she got rid of the character. She absolutely shouldn't. She wrote the Minotaur, who was a man with a dinner jacket. You know, the Minotaur is half bull and half man. And she had him just pounding his head against a wall. It was the most marvelous idea that you have this man in a dinner jacket just banging his head against a wall. <laughs> so he was a Minotaur. So she has this way of translating classical uh, forms into people you might know. <laughs> <laughs> don't know that many people who bang their heads against walls, but you know. Um, so uh, she really is a, a prod, and I did a play called um, Woman and Scarecrow, but it was only moderately successful. I think the play itself didn't quite do what plays might need to do, but the ideas in it were just marvellous. Um, and then more recently, I've worked with Colm Tobin on his novel, um, Stroke, play uh, Testament of Mary. And that was an interesting experience. Did it matter they were Irish? Um, yes, I mean, it does matter. But nor would I say that because I'm Irish, I understand all Irish things. Um, no more than I think sometimes Irish writing doesn't envelop enough of the enormous variation that there is in being Irish. You know, the very famous and popular sort of skull-battering plays is not everyone's experience of being Irish, but they are very funny. <laughs> um, and actually, I think Lionel Pilkington wrote a very interesting article about, uh, at the beginning of the book about Irish theatre, saying that Ireland has always turned itself into a funny place before it even writes plays about itself. <laughs> that it refuses just to be a place. It has to be a place, a theatrical place. It's a sort of a surrealism, in a way. There's always a sort of surreal ground where mad things can happen. And even that would even go back to sing, in a way. But um, these two people uh, who I worked with, they, it mattered they were Irish in that um, we had sort of certain things in common, I suppose. Uh, with Colm, uh, it was very, very interesting to have the voice of the Virgin Mary written in an Irish woman's mind. He had said some time ago that he had me in mind when he wrote a piece about the Virgin Mary, but I don't think he did. <laughs> I really don't. Um, not just because of Virgin Mary, and, but it didn't sound like me, actually. It didn't, but he may have had some notion. But, uh, um, so he, uh, he wrote this piece, and what he's very good at is plugging into his own childhood, and he said his own mother and his aunts and their relationship to the Virgin Mary. Uh, but... As I got to know him more, um, because we spent a lot of time in New York together, I realized how different Wexford was from Cork. <laughs> so if anything, I learned how different he was. Mm. And in terms of the way that you appear as Irish or not, I'm wondering how you feel critics see you. So do you notice in a difference in the visibility of your own Irishness, I suppose, say in Britain against maybe performing here, do people receive you differently, do you think? 
It is you who say it. <laughs> and I have. The, well, I don't know how crit critics, I mean... Well, it's interesting, for example, we think about Richard II, oh, uh, yes. which Fiona played in the National Theatre in, in London in 1995. Yes. The critics, to, to borrow Nancy Mitford, the critics were like hens who'd seen a fox. You know, they all got <laughs> terribly upset by um, a woman playing an English king. And there was all kinds of really interesting things at stake around the representation of the monarchy in England, I think, and the, the blurring <laughs> between Shakespeare's kings and real kings. But what they missed wholesale was the fact that he's also an English king who invades Ireland during the course of the play, <laughs> being played by an Irish woman. Yeah. And, this, and it struck me that while that show didn't come here, the critics here really would have seen that, that that would have been visible. It's perhaps. such a shame it didn't get to play here. It, it, yeah. it was too expensive. It was a very expensive show um, because it had pian pianos and all sorts. It was very expensive. <laughs> um, but it was, you're absolutely right, that it, it was... Um, uh, uh, very interesting. I, I played. I was the only female in the in the play. It wasn't some, uh, you know, uh, gender reverse, which is a difficult thing to do, though brilliantly successfully done recently by Philip Lloyd and her Julius mm -hmm. Caesar, which is spectacular. But it uh, there's been lots of all male Shakespeare, but very little all female Shakespeare. But Richard II isn't really much of a man, you know, in the sense that he doesn't really deal with his mother or his girlfriend, you know, which Hamlet does. So I was being asked to play Hamlet, and I thought, what is this? You know, men can play Hamlet, and I'll do something else. Um, but when I was asked to play Richard II, he doesn't really have a girlfriend, and he doesn't have a mother, and he really is quite girly. So the idea was that maybe, because he's quite girly, you wouldn't have to worry about trying to be girly if you already were a girl. You could just play it. So the cast was mainly men. But in order to get a girl to look like I say the word girl because it's some time ago now. Um, to look like a boy, it's very hard because women do dress as men now. So if you put a girl in jeans, she just looks like a girl in jeans. Um, so in the end, I was bandaged up like a sort of mummy. And my court, who are very, very gorgeous men, two of them African actors, Jude Akutiki, and the other guy, God, I can't remember his name now. They were huge and they had skirts. So there was a sort of feminine sort of court that I had. Um, and indeed, I started off old John of Gaunt, time on in Lancaster, cast thou according to thy oath and ban, brought hither Henry, and, and on I went. And the critics went mad. But one of the letters that Richard Eyre, who was the artistic director of the National Theatre, got was a complaint that there were no black men in the court of, <laughs> of Richard II, and just didn't notice at all that I was a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so. We were, we were all caught between a rock and a hard place, whether to complain <laughs> about racism or be delighted that there was no racism or sexism. Um, so it was a very, very good experiment at sort of pro, uh, uh, just provoking uh, the sacred cow of, of uh, an entire verse play. But it, 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 I was sorry it hadn't come to, to, to Dublin. I, there was talk of it and it just didn't, it, it just couldn't. But if it had, it would have been very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I wonder whether your Irishness would actually have figured more almost than you being female or the, those things being tied up together. Yes, it's all about going to Ireland and getting those red-headed cairns and knocking their heads together. It's marvellous. It was absolutely mm. great. And similarly, I'm, I'm interested when you come, came here to play Medea, um, that, you know, Medea is a foreigner. She's in exile. Um, she comes to Corinth and is, is, you know, feels her outsidedness very strongly. And again, that sort of played out in an interesting way. In certain ways, it was like you were playing non-Irish in that performance. Yes. yes. Medea is about a woman who comes finally to the only country that will have her because she killed her brother. Um, she runs off with Jason, and in order to slow down her father, who's chasing her, she chopped up her brother and threw, threw, threw bits of him off the back of the car. So that certainly did hold up the father because he had to pick up the bits of the dead brother. I mean, <laughs> these people were not, not nice, they were terrifying. Anyway, they, um, she, it, it was a symbol of how much she loved Jason, that she was willing to chop up her brother and throw him out as a bit of father fodder. Anyway, she got <laughs> to this country and the king, who's called unimaginatively Crayon, which means king, uh, he, he, he sort of gets very interested in Jason, who is sort of, David Beckham, really, and tries to encourage David Beckham to marry his wife, uh, to marry his daughter. So after a while, married life becoming tedious, um, Jason does start to get ready to marry the local princess. And so slightly 
understates his relationship with uh, Medea as though we didn't really get married or we only got married in the Dominican Republic or, you know, something like that. <laughs> um, you know, didn't really count. There was no priest there. And the, the vague feeling is she, she feels a bit unmarried and so she's trapped because she can't go back to where she's from because she chopped up her brother. She can't go anywhere else. Uh, she's done lots of magical things otherwhere else. And so she, Crayon comes in and he just tells her to leave and she has to leave. And so here in Dublin, um, I hope I wasn't an outsider. I was from Cork and I was in Dublin. That was scary enough. And the <laughs> chorus girls who were great, they did a clever thing, which is that they, whenever they didn't want me to understand something, they would speak in Irish. So this idea was fine and it worked really well and Dublin audiences enjoyed it. And then we went to London. But there, of course, we had an English chorus and they didn't know any Irish. So there was one other Irish actress in it who played the, the, the maid who was Siobhan McCarthy. So Siobhan McCarthy, Siobhan had been living in England for a long time. She had about, she had literally cupola fuckle, I mean, really. So um, whenever we didn't want the chorus, you know, we were saying we'd speak in Irish. <laughs> and we'd say a thing, you know. I thought, you know. I'm just going to talk to you know, I'm going to talk to you know, I'm going to talk to you know, we'd say a couple of meaningless words. I'm just going to talk to you know, I'm just going to talk to all that happened was that the English audience were bewildered whenever this happened. They didn't know what we were doing. They thought we'd, we were having a sort of fit. So we, <laughs> <laughs> so we had to cut that out. <laughs> but it was a nice idea here, but it was hopeless there. You then work out that the foreigner has to not understand the local language and the audience have to understand the local language. You can't do it the other way around. Right. Um, I wonder, should we open up to some questions yes. for a bit and then maybe return to conversation? Not a thing. We've obviously no. said everything. There's nothing more. <laughs> all <laughs> the <laughs> questions have been answered. No more. It all. It all. Who said you'd take a picture? <laughs> no question. Here's a question. Oh. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, pardon, about playing Testament on Broadway? Mm -hmm. um, oh. Be an Irish woman playing the Virgin Mary in Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> well, this was, you know, there's bravery and there's foolhardiness. And I have to say, the latter is what caused that debacle. Because a man called Scott Rudin, who is the most powerful producer in the world and a delightful person, incredibly knowledgeable, very ambitious, uh, said, we're going to open the Testament of, Broad of Mary on Broadway. It was by then a novel, not really a play at all. You had had a version of the play here, but everybody agreed that we would try and rewrite it using the novel uh, to expand it for Broadway. So over last winter, I spent a lot of time rewriting the play. Colin was very, very kind in that he allowed us to do pretty well whatever we wanted. In fact, I learned about three versions of that play. I, I, we would do one version and we'd do another version. And then Scott would every now and then turn up from America and go, I like the bit where she says that. And because normally we're working in a subsidized theater, it was amazing having this man say, I want that bit in. You think, okay, we'll put it in. Now you can't really write plays like that. <laughs> so we'd put in that bit and we'd try that bit and then he'd like it and he'd feel better. And then we went to New York and uh, we began to uh, rehearse it there. And it's an amazing piece because it's the Virgin Mary 10 years, or, you know, maybe 15 years after her son has been crucified. And the premise of it is very, very good, that she absolutely doesn't know what the fuss is about her son. And she knows him to be a sort of, a uh, rather shy boy who, as he grew up, he'd sometimes have friends around and he'd start practicing preaching with them. And uh, she'd say she just found his voice was all false and untrue and she didn't know what he was doing, sort of elocution lessons. Um, and then later she heard when he left home that uh, he went to Jerusalem along with a whole lot of other people who went for what's kind of an industrial revolution. And then he, she heard that he was sort of shouting at people saying, take up your bed and walk and things like that and really upsetting people on the Sabbath. So she's very worried as she sets out to go to, um, to, go to, the wed to a wedding of their cousin to see where she could get, tell him to come home and to stop this. Really, it's not helping her. And when she gets to the wedding, there's a fantastic bit where... Uh, he comes into a room and he's dressed all in purple. So this wonderful conflagration in, in, in Colum's mind of all the Renaissance paintings of Christ rather than whoever he might have looked like in, in, in the early days, uh, that you know, he's, he was wearing purple, which he shouldn't have been wearing. And he was, you get a feeling that he'd become a bit of a pop star. You know, he really had, and he had too many followers. And, 
And when she said, you know, you've got to get away from here, it's very dangerous for being watched, he said, woman, what have I to do with you? And of course, that is one of the few quotations that you have in the uh, New Testament of him speaking to her at all and how she was mortified. And then he repeated it, woman, what have I to do with you? And she just melts with embarrassment that he's got too grand for his mother. So it's an incredibly clever idea because Broadway audiences are full of mothers mm -hmm. whose sons have got too big for their boots. <laughs> Not least Scott Rudin's father, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, it was incredibly popular with women of a certain age. Who it was not popular with was right-wing Catholic contingents who decided that the movie called The Testament of Mary that was opening on Broadway, the movie, uh, was sinful and it was betraying Ireland and betraying Catholicism because it was sacrilegious. In fact, I can honestly say it put people more in touch with what the joyous secularism of religion should be uh, than anything I've ever experienced. It began, uh, we began with a sort of installation where, <laughs> this sounds a bit mad, but it isn't really. There was a big glass box and in the middle of the box was me dressed entirely in the Virgin Mary Immaculate Conception garments. Pink, lovely thing, big, huge, blue veil, and a pool of water below, in which there was light flickering, and I held a lily and an orb. I didn't look like myself at all. <laughs> and anybody in the audience was allowed to come up to this and do whatever they liked. So people would come up and pass by it. There was also, there was also, um, uh, what do you call it? What are those birds that eat things? A vulture. There was a vulture, a live vulture, on the stage there as well. So people took a lot of photographs of the vulture. And <laughs> I, I was a bit frightened of the vulture until somebody said they're only interested in dead meat. So <laughs> they won't peck you if you're alive. So the trick is to keep breathing and you're fine. <laughs> so I had to have the vulture, but I had the vulture at this point of the play. And pe the audience came in through the auditorium or through the backstage and they could walk past it. And Deborah is a genius at these... Um, installations. People just love them. So people were phoning each other going, you won't guess where I am. I'm on Broadway. I'm looking at the Virgin Mary. I'm standing on the stage. It's incredible. <laughs> because Broadway itself is a kind of mecca for theatre obsessives. And it's kind of, if you're on the stage, you're kind of at the altar. You sort of really are. You're on an altar. People couldn't believe that they were on the stage. And so this went on for 20 minutes before the play started. And then they would go back to their seats. Oh no, some of them then would come up to the glass and some of them would press their noses against the glass and go, I love you. <laughs> and I, very interesting things happened. Sometimes two very kind of butch men would come up and they'd go, <laughs> then they'd come back and the other one would come back and go, sorry. <laughs> This is during the preview time. Nobody had made any judgment. And then sometimes uh, people would kneel and they would pray. And I, would start, I began to think, well, maybe I could get your daughter her exams. <laughs> <laughs> Go in peace. I mean, if you, you know, you don't play these parts without some of it rubbing off. <laughs> um, and during the play, the, the coup of the play is that, is that um, I drank a lot of whiskey during the play, which wasn't, and, and kept on trying to roll cigarettes. I never was quite smoked. She's trying to, she's sort of traumatized really from the death of her son. And I had a lot of barbed wire, a lot of barbed wire in the play. And there was also a very deep pool, uh, nine feet deep. And at the crucifixion, she does turn up for the crucifixion and she suddenly sees a man who really frightens her. She thinks he's going to kill her. And so she runs away with two others, uh, Mary Magdalene and another man. Uh, one of the apostles. She runs away from the crucifixion, which is the fantastic sacrilegious moment, really, that she left the crucifixion. And so every deposition scene that ever painted, you know, really should have the Virgin Mary scratched out. It's a very clever game that Cullum's playing. And it is not religion. It is literature or theatre or playfulness. 
And I ran away and I'd dive into this pool. I'd just take off all my clothes and then I'd run, d dive into this pool uh, in order to sort of wash myself of the sin. And I'd go right down nine feet under the ground. Now, the pool also had in it a gold tree that came up at the end of the show, this beautiful, magical gold tree. So I had to dive down and avoid the gold tree for obvious <laughs> reasons. <laughs> and that was quite difficult. I had to really go right down to the pool and just not let any of the leaves or the branches attack my person. And then up I came. But one day, they would change the water in the pool, and it was ice cold, and I dived in. And when I came out, I honestly didn't know I could continue. I thought I was going to die. I came up, and I... Nobody told me the temperature was... This was, you know, March. It was absolutely freezing. And I, I came up, and I, I continued on with the play, and I was... Ugh. Within a day, I had the most frightful cold. I mean, just obviously, in that moment, every bug in New York thought, she's down, get her, you know? And I was... <laughs> So I went in going, oh, I feel terrible. And uh, wait, wait, don't worry, we're, we're going to play. And they said, right, but don't worry, we're, we're heating the water, we're heating the water, and we're putting salt in the water. I thought, you haven't put salt in So they put salt in the water, and they heated the water, and they said, every day you can, tempt, you can just test it. I said, we're all human, we know exactly, it just mustn't be cold water. But in order to bend over backwards, they made it kind of hot water. So <laughs> then I could jump down into the pool, and I would kind of scald myself, avoid the tree, come up, <laughs> and then the thing. And within no time, every bug that hadn't attacked me in the cold water <laughs> said, this is a nice warm pool, let's live here for it. <laughs> sure enough, I got the most awful ear infection ever known to man. Terrible, some th terrible creature got into my ear. So soon I began to not be able to hear uh, anything. I couldn't hear the audience laugh, I couldn't hear anything. I would, I would speak and I was down a tunnel to myself and I would continue acting it. And it was terrible because on the press night, you know, all the lords and ladies of Byzantium came. You have all your Meryl Streeps and your Jodie Fosters and your, they all come. And it's marvelous. I was going, how do you do? Well, all I could hear is, <laughs> I was going, are you speaking to me? You know, <laughs> just like a movie. So um, anyway, it, it, the, by, on the day of the opening, the, the right-wing Catholics, who are really now very exercised, decided to take over the entire street. But they were up against it and they were going to ruin the opening. It was a very good idea. They, were, they brought three busloads of children, very good idea, who had drums. And they brought megaphones, which they weren't allowed to use because Scott had paid off most of the NYPD to not allow any <laughs> megaphones. But they did bring drums, and then they brought cleverly bagpipes. <laughs> and so from about five o'clock on, you could hear the mountains of Morn being kind of wheezed out. <laughs> What that had to do with the Virgin Mary, sweep down. And Scott was outside on the main theatre, on the street. He hired a huge pantechnican truck to sit in front of the theatre. He then had carpenters build padded kind of duvets to put over every door so that as the show began, you couldn't hear anything of the drums and the bagpipes and the mountains of the moor and the people chanting that I was a heretic or something and that I shouldn't be in the movie of the <laughs> Testament of Mary. <laughs> and, and it went on. So it was really heading for great success, the show in general, because that was a lot of uh, publicity. But we just pipped, were pipped to the post by, I think we opened too late into the season. Uh, the, we, we, were nominated for everything except the important nominations like best actress or best director. We were be best sound, best lighting, best everything except best actor. So he took the show off and that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> But I am going to do it again in London next spring, so it'll, it'll rise again. Great. Do you think you'll do it here? Could um, it be done here? Oh, yes, it could be done here if anybody wants to invite it. I'd love, be, love to do it. But I think you've just, you had it here. You had, you yeah, had, you had uh, yeah, Drew Mullen, but we did, we, yeah. did a very, we did a more watery production, as you can tell me. <laughs> um, I wonder, could you talk a bit about what the difference is working in these different sorts of contexts? Because you, you do move from London to New York to Dublin, and each of those has its own sort of system, its own context, and also its own tradition. And I wonder again, does that matter? Is it really just about the individual production you're in, or do those broader contexts feature in the ways that you are able to work or not able to work? Well, I think I've given you a taste of what Broadway is, which is that you actually can't have a committee on a play. 
when I say foolhardy, the thing that should have happened is we should have opened the play in a synagogue somewhere in the East End of London and maybe made a bit of a stir and then moved to a bigger synagogue and then maybe moved to a church in New York and we would have had a huge audience. I, I, I think we, we were arrogant. Mm. I don't think I was arrogant, but I'm trying to be generous. Somebody was arrogant. <laughs> and I think it was probably, we were all arrogant. Uh, to think that you can just land with a new play straight onto Broadway. These things, nothing I've ever done has not been tried and tested and tested and tried and redone and reworked. And that's the only way to make the work good, I think. So I think I learned my lesson there. Uh, but in terms of different styles, the nice thing about working in England is in general, I've worked in the subsidised section, you know, um, Electra that you mentioned, or they're, they're subsidised, and they are in that way. We are a state uh, service. I mean, we 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 work on behalf of people who don't make plays to make plays for the people who don't make plays. I think that's what we do. I don't think it has an end beyond. It has not got a commercial end, which is a fantastic civilised thing to have, and you have it here in Ireland. It's just fantastic to have a theatre whose purpose is to say something to the community about the community. I think that's what mm. we do. Um, but in, um, I have traveled with plays and it is very interesting. When we did Happy Days, uh, we opened in London and people found it very funny. And then we went to Greece in Epidavros and we played to 12,000 people in one night in that big Epidavros theater with just a nightingale was the only thing that made a sound. Uh, I heard, I, it was absolute bliss, and I was buried up to my neck. You can't think that's bliss, but it was bliss to speak this wonderful Beckett language in this uh, weird sort of spliced brain of a shape of a theater. And all of those people doing what they did 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, turning up at a weekend just to see if there was something they could talk about in Athens the following day. A really, uh, I mean, a privilege of, of life. That was really be one of the highlights. And then we took it to BAM and people laughed a lot because American audiences laugh a lot at violence. Anything violent they think is hysterically funny. And then we brought it to Dublin, finally, and people laughed less. <laughs> it's very interesting, the city with the greatest sense of humour, but they laughed less. Now, maybe I was less good, but I don't think it was that. I think it was just, <laughs> I would say something about it. Maybe they'd been becketed out, or maybe, um, I, I don't know. It was very, that was an interesting sociological survey <laughs> that I share with you. Um, do you think leaving mattered? Do you think, do you think your career has been shaped by moving from Cork to London? Does, does that journey, <coughs> that voyage, as it were, is that, is that crucial? Well, I, I mean, I, I never intended not to come back. You know, I, I mean, I, I couldn't conceive of life without Cork when I was in Cork. Um, but I, there was no training at that time in Ireland for a young actor. And I did feel that if I didn't train, I would always be uh, dragging my worries and the gap between what people could do and what could be done with the theatre. And my, I just felt I would be never really able to keep up. And I didn't want that feeling. So when I went to Rada for the first time in my life, I did some work. I'd never done a stroke of work before. Um, I had had a marvelous time. I mean, I did a bit of work. I, I, I did philosophy at, at UCC, but I didn't really do work, much work. I didn't do any work. <laughs> and then I worked very hard when I was at Rada. And the result was when I left Rada, I won these prizes, which they've got rid of since, probably very wisely because you don't make many friends when you win prizes. <laughs> and I won the Bancroft Gold Medal and a thing called the Ronson Award, which gave me immediately a sort of public recognition at that moment. And it was a wonderful stepping stone for a young, unknown Irish person. You know, it was great because when I went to Rada first, I, as the, you know, as the headmaster there said, he said, you smelt of libraries. I thought, I hope it was only libraries. Um, and the, the, uh, so I, I think leaving, you know, then I very quickly got a job at the National Theatre in The Rivals with Geraldine McEwen and Michael Horden and Tim Curry. And suddenly I was running with these big runners and it was really very instantaneous. And I think, had I not, I think I would have absolutely come back. 
but I suddenly was then quickly sent to the RSC. And then you're on a sort of, at that time, a sort of ladder, which was a brilliant structure for a young actor. And I think that structure of the following four years, which I spent four years at the RSC and a year at the National Theatre, meant really that once I hit 30, I was like a sort of heavyweight boxer. You know, I'd really done the muscle work. And so I was able to stay. I think that's why. But it wasn't meant or planned. Mm. But leaving, the sad thing about leaving is it is very hard to get back. That is true. Mm. And, you know, you say voyage in return. I would say voyage in return and voyage again. I think that's what happens. And, um, and return again, maybe. But uh, it, 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 it's very, very hard to get back. Do, do you think it, it makes for a good artist to have left somewhere? Do you think that helps? I don't know. There's some very good artists who stayed at home, too. Mm. I, I, I don't think I, I would say that. But certainly for me, I suspect my horizons were broadened. Um, certainly the thing I learned was the responsibility of playing big roles in big houses. It's panic-making. And at the moment, I'm directing this Rape of Lucretia, and I can see in the two main singers, and indeed with Anna Natrepko last week at, uh, you know, in the Met, that whatever you do to direct something, the leading performer has to carry that evening like nobody else does. And, you know, the real skill in acting is having to do it all the time at the right level. You can, everybody can maybe work something up to a certain moment and play it once. But to do that same thing with that same group at the same standard the following day is really the discipline of it. And I'd, I really learned that mm -hmm. because I had to do these long runs of things. And I think... Um, it's ma it changed my relationship to concentration massively. I, I'm very concentrated at that, at nothing else, incidentally. I lose my wallet and my car keys and everything. But I, I became very, very concentrated and, a, and about slightly the monastic living of subjugating a lot of your life for it. You gain everything. It's fantastically privileged to be opening on Broadways or in, or in Athens or... It is bliss, really, but it does also ask of you that you do go to bed a bit earlier than you'd like to and maybe not be as wild as you remember being. Um, you, you, it does take a toll. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a last question, if I may, and then maybe we could open out to some questions for another 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. Um, can I ask you about the future um, in that... Uh, let's do some predicting. I'm wondering what, what the next projects are. Um, I'm interested by a, a seeming kind of interest in space and also new forms. So obviously opera, also working with poetry. Um, where, where are you going next? What are your hopes? Or is it just all accidental? Uh, well, some of it's accidental, I hope. I mean, accidents are nice too. Uh, the, the, I'm about to do The Ancient Mariner, which is the poem, uh, with a dancer called... Uh, the the choreographer is called Kim Brumstrup, and uh, I, the dancer is called Daniel, and he's just fantastic, this boy, and he just dances. You know, the ancient mariner is really two people speaking. There's the guest and there's the ancient mariner speaking. And uh, he dances it, but in, every now and then we swap who's the guest and who's the mariner. And uh, we did it last year, uh, first of all in Greece, and then we did it in, in London under the... Uh, Waterloo Tunnels, and Mel Mercier from uh, County Waterford, he did the soundscape, which was fantastic. And we're going to take that to BAM. So that's the next media project. But in terms of futures, I think I would like to do something in this country for the celebration of the centenary. And not in this country, but I'd love to do something with young actors for 2016. That's what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. Gosh, there we are. Um, right, I wonder if we could have some questions and comments. Please just keep an eye out for microphones. There's microphones on either side. So we have a question here. Uh, where would you think that the biggest or best places outside London would, in England, outside London, would be for theatre? Do you mean as an actor or just for the audiences? Or? Just for the audiences. Well, the Edinburgh Festival is pretty good, I think. And... What's sad is that what used to be a fantastically healthy regional thing has gone. And it, nearly gone, it hasn't gone everywhere. But there's some very good places. Bristol seems to be doing very, very good things. And um, I mean, a lot of places. York seems to be doing good things. And, but theatre has changed 
remarkably. It's much more event-based now. So every now and then something remarkable occurs. There's no, uh, there's not a kind of school of theatre that works particularly well. And, you know, I have infinite uh, respect for what is being now experimented with. Is it you, me, yum yum tree? Bum bum tree? Bum dum, bum bum tree. I mean, yeah. this is the most fantastic thing that's happened, which is that there's only one member of the audience and there's about 500 people in the play. I mean, that's... <laughs> That is a new event, and I went to see one of them, and it was just brilliant. You slide down a chute, and suddenly you're in a room, and there's a whole lot of... You're, you're, suddenly, you're suddenly asked, what are we going to do because we're losing the match, by a whole lot of football players. You think, well, I don't know. Um, they say, just tell us what to do. You think, well, I, I think we should, we should work harder. They go, yeah, work harder, work harder, and then they run out. And you realise you are just in a play, because there's something about the theatre, which is... And I'm sure, I mean, as we get older, oddly... It's about an opportunity to be a ghost in your own life, is what I think it is. And I remember uh, Deborah did a very interesting installation at the um, St. Pancras station, where you wandered around various doors of a hotel room and you could see shoes and socks and everything, depending on who you thought was in the hotel room. And up at the very top were maids from the 19th century taking coal scuttles to and fro, and you stood there, but they couldn't see you and you realised you were the dead person, not them. And I think a lot of theatre is an opportunity not to be dead, but to be in infinity. Because if you're seeing a play set in Chekhov's time, then you're from the future, but you're also somewhere watching something for the first time, even though that time is gone. And if you're seeing somebody... Um, dying or going through the experience of death, you somehow come away at the end of it having had some of the experience of death. And maybe that will be useful <laughs> when the time comes, that nothing that happens on the earth hasn't happened already. And that's an incredibly comforting notion. So um, I think that's what it does. Hmm. Um, I think there's a question yeah. here. What do you, do you, do you want of, uh, the new technology of having the National Theatre on the big screen in Melbourne, Dublin, anywhere else. What do I think of the new technology? Having the, 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 as an as a actor, I can't stand it. I absolutely can't stand it. They did it last year to us at the National. We were doing um, London Assurance, Simon Russell Beale being very funny. And it was a very silly, funny play. And the audience was there, a thousand people in the audience. And these cameras were moving up and down doing this and it was being beamed to 800,000 people around the world. And all our sweat and all our, just, you know, 18th century wig, lay, wig lays, um, was seen by everybody. However, my father was very ill at the time, and he was able to go to the opera house in Cork with my mother and see it. And I can see that from that way round, it's absolutely a godsend to people. And the same, too, with the opera. The Met Opera I've just done is going to be beamed around the world next week. And I'm going to go and see it. I haven't been able to see it. I'm going to see it myself. So it's certainly doing something marvellous. What it may do to cost, I don't know. It's much cheaper, of course, to, to, to see it on the screen. And I'm worried of what it does to the eye when you see it on the screen. But if it means that more people go to the theatre, then it's, I suppose it's a good thing. I think we have a question just here, man in the blue t-shirt. Just two quick follow-up questions, Fiona, on, on Jägen at the Met. This would have been the first project you've ever directed, not in English. Is that right? So I just wonder about your experience of directing the text <laughs> in Russian. Oh, um, and then just also it being the largest performing arts organization in the world, and yeah. obviously with very difficult schedules, how does one go about transferring artistic intention and nuance and actually achieving that in, in those conditions? It's impossible. Um, the Metropolitan Opera raises $180 million every year to try and just pay for its 37 unions of musicians, you know, translators. In the rehearsal room that I was in, which is Eugene Onegin, which had been done at the English National Opera already, so I was taking over something that already had been done, um, the chorus is 88 people. They're working on three operas in the same week. You only get them for sort of two-hour sessions. But in the room where there was the uh, performers, there was, I suppose, 47 people just on this side of things. There was a translator for the Russians, because the Russians couldn't speak English, 
There's a translator for the English, because we can't speak Russian. There's, trans there's a conductor, an assistant conductor. There's the, the covers, because any opera singer can get sick at any time. There is the performers. There's the performers' families, if they're Russian. Um, and everything is in Russian. And whenever they'd say, so Fiona, where should we go from? I used to say, let's go from oh Borgia, which was the only word I knew, which is oh God, oh Borgia. I'd say, let's go from oh Borgia again. Oh Borgia, and they'd start. Um, uh, it, it's an impossible language. So I had the thing written in phonetical Russian, which I couldn't speak. I mean, it, it, even with the phonetics, that's without it being in its own language. And it was absolutely bewildering. I luckily knew it in my head pretty well off by heart. And I, um, so I knew the English in my head, but you still, if they stop, it's terribly hard to tell them what you want to go back to. And of course, you have no idea of whether what they're doing is correct. The only brilliant thing is that Russians, when they're singing in Russian, are so like the Irish tradition of being seeped in their own culture that Pushkin and the story of Eugene Onegin and Tatiana is so much part of who they are, they know every bit of it. And one wonderful thing happened. There's a bit in Onegin, Tatiana who falls in love with this sort of no good man and writes him a letter saying, I love you. And he comes in and goes, I'm afraid I got this letter, but I don't love you, goodbye. And then six weeks, years later comes back and goes, I think I do love you. And she says, goodbye. Um, that really is it. I, but there's a wonderful bit where she writes in the window, Onegin with her finger, and he comes into the room. And uh, we had a glass house in act one of this, and we were rehearsing and rehearsing, and, I, and Anna Natrepko said, I am too much in the light here, I don't like the light. We must change all the mise-en-scene, she would say, I think, all the mise-en-scene, about five million dollars worth of set here, but never mind. Um, and then I said, why don't you get out of the light and go up to the back? And she said, I said, look out the window and put your hand to the glass, and she said, and can I write O for Onegin? And I said, yes. And she wept. Because they are steeped in this Pushkin. She said, now I know I'm in Pushkin. And so she did O for Onegin. And I think that sort of means that you have a fair idea that they're singing it with their entire hearts. And they don't sound like opera singers. They sound like a Welsh choir. They sound like what they're singing just comes from the ground. And so that is the benefit of being with Russians. But uh, without Russian, do not try this at home. <laughs> 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 um, we've got three more questions. So we've got okay. a woman in a grey top here. Yes. Uh, hi, Fiona. Firstly, um, absolute wonder to hear you speak. So thank you so much. Um, I want to be like you, and I do love you. Um, secondly, <laughs> as a performer, <laughs> thank you. Um, as a performer, what do you do when you're approaching a role and you're building the character and you feel that you've lost grasp of it? I mean, have you ever felt playing a role that you just think that the director has miscast you, what do you do to bring it back? What do you do to kind of feel, to try and re redeem it for yourself? Because I suppose it goes through a roller coaster of emotions, so I just want to know what you do to approach that way. Well, I was just having lunch with my friend Dennis, you know, and we were sort of admitting to ourselves that we really haven't changed at all in the 40 years that we've known each other. So I've never used the theatre as a place to find out anything really about myself. And the funny thing about the theatre in both our countries, I mean, our countries, I'm saying this country and the other country, is that really character is situation. How you meet a situation tells you the character, not the character, because otherwise you get into that cliched thing of my character wouldn't do that, you know. My character wouldn't say to be or not to be, that's the question. He just would never ask that question. <laughs> um, and you know you'd be on a sort of, on a no-hoper. The point is, this is what the person says. And Peter Brook said brilliantly, you know, it is not what you do to the language, it's what the language does to you. And the really great thing, having been brought up in such a, an exam-ridden system that we all were at school, was finding that whatever response you had to the language, there was no wrong answer. You know, there is no wrong answer. You, you meet it, and if it sounds peculiar, it's because you're a bit peculiar, and your peculiarity might be your special thing. You don't need to try and do it like the brother did it. You don't need to do it 
like anybody else before you did it. And the really astonishing thing about generation is that if you were playing Electra, you would play it at some profoundly different place than where I will, because you would have lived through a younger time than me. And that, you know, the freedom of that means that whatever the appearance of the egotistical nature of acting is, actually an actor is just a piece of a flag blowing in the wind of their own time. And if they're good, they catch some of the wind of their own time and they flap it about a bit. <laughs> I don't think I should write poems, do you? Um, <laughs> but it, it, so that you, you can only be true to your own time. And the really terrible downside of that is you can become a bit outdated. And that is why older actors seem outdated to young actors, because they were true to their time. And there's a point comes where it's very hard to remain. Um, in, so uh, when I approach a character, uh, I don't really approach it as a character. I think here I go again. And uh, let's see what this thing is asking. Hi, Fiona. Um, I'm just wondering, as an actor, what is the role of the writer for you in a production? Because it seems language is, and text is very important to you. Uh, well, text is. Uh, I, um, I did one show with Bob Wilson where he doesn't think of text at all as any way interesting. So he say, he'd say, keep talking until this... Until this flag comes down, then stop. So I say, but there's a very good sentence here where, you know, and then the skulls were being lifted up by the soldier. <laughs> and he'd stop. And it was fascinating. He would stop because he wasn't interested in, the, in what the meaning was that the language carried. And I had worked with a Chinese director called Shen Shisheng, who said that language has become so untrue in the 20th and 21st centuries that in Beijing, you would read the Beijing Times and you would see weather report, <laughs> you'd see sunshine, sunshine in Beijing today, and you would look out the window and it would be raining. And he said, this is the problem, that politics had stolen language, and the same too in America, and you know, God, it's been absolutely frightful hearing uh, Obama talk such nonsense about Syria and such high-handedness, you know, because you think this just isn't true, what's being said. Uh, so that a new theater mustn't necessarily believe in the veracity of language. I was just brought up in it. So for me, it's absolutely the, the, the rope that I would hold on to. But the other part that I played was a character called Young Woman, <laughs> at the time, uh, in a play called Mackinal by a woman called Sophie Treadwell that was on at the National about 20 years ago. And in that, the woman couldn't speak very much. She used to just say, I want to be somebody, somebody. I'm nobody. Nobody. And I think that's all she said more or less during the play. I'm nobody. I'm out. I need to get out. I think she said various things like that. So she couldn't speak. And it was an incredibly powerful play. And it was fantastic experience to only have these lines. I, I'm nobody. Nobody. And the play was a huge success. I was amazed because it really didn't have anything in it except the situation was so terrible that the woman's inarticulacy was her strength. And I would say that's why fundamentally film has become so fantastically popular in America because it is the storytelling tool of the inarticulate. I don't mean that there, but it means that it doesn't matter who you are, whether you were educated or not educated, your story has a poetry because it's blown up onto that screen. And whether you're a cowboy who cannot speak or whatever, uh, your story has an epic classical quality and it's got nothing to do with language. So we have a lady here and then here. Hello, Fiona. Um, I came to see you play Galatia in Scenes of an Execution last November in London. It's one of my favorite plays and I loved it. And I was wondering whether you felt uh, any parallels or correlations between Galatia's experience as a woman artist working in a profession dominated by male roles or opportunities for men. Um, this was a play by Howard Barker called um, Scenes for an Execution in which the main protagonist is a woman called Galatia who's been commissioned by Venice to paint a huge celebration of the Battle of Lepanto, um, in which the Battle of Lepanto was fought in 1683, was it? 1583. And it was a really close shave in that uh, there were so many men killed on both sides that when the Venetians claimed they had won it uh, against the Turks, they really 
could barely claim that. I think just the Turks didn't speak Italian. I think they just said, we won, we won, we won, we won. Um, in fact, the Turks had never, ever been beaten on the sea uh, by the Venetians. But so this was seen as a huge. Anyway, she, she did paint this huge, or, you know, and there are various versions of these battles of Lepanto. She's sort of fictitious, really. Uh, and that she paints the painting, but she puts all the horror of, uh, of the war into her painting. And uh, she gets into great trouble for that. But actually, because Howard Barker is Howard Barker, she should really die and be murdered for it. And then we'd all think how great she was. But he doesn't even let her get murdered. At the end, she decides she doesn't really care whether the painting's good or not. She, does, she wants to go out to dinner, and that's the end of it. Um, <laughs> so it has a sort of anti-tragic quality. But it is a fantastic celebration of uh, a woman uh, in the midst of a, it, living a life so free in the midst of that rather re repressed society. And uh, I enjoyed playing that very much. So one final question from this the lady, lady up here. The gray, I'm the lady yeah. up the grey. She's really yeah. had a long wait. Yes. She keeps putting Thank her hand Thank you for up. your patience. Yeah. She's probably drowning by now. <laughs> <laughs> um, another sort of practical question for you. Yes. Um, when you're working as an actor, what skills or qualities do you find most helpful from your director? Oh, kindness. I, um, you want to feel confident that the director can, um, patience is often a thing you really want from a director. Patience and the ability to go really wrong, really wrong for a long time. Um, that's really where I found things and that's very hard. Funny enough, two of my singers yesterday had a sort of meltdown because they we really need to know what we're doing at the beginning of this opera and we don't. And they know really what they're doing the rest of the time and I wanted to leave the end, the beginning till the very end, because often if you can hold your nerve through a kind of journey of, of a, a desert and being lost, you'll find something much better than if you solve it early. So, but of course you do need people to hold your nerve with you. And often very good ideas come very, very late because some other thing is at play. You're learning everything you can about the play. You're learning how it ends and then you learn the middle of it. And then you begin to think, ah, well, maybe the beginning needs this or that. Or the... So patience at the, is very, very hard, uh, very, very important thing to learn. And a sort of crudeness in approach. I, I don't particularly want the director to tell me we're going to go in here carefully. Bruce Chapman writes a wonderful thing in, in um, in What Are You Doing Here, one of those books, where he was invited by the Aboriginals to go hunting um, kangaroos. And he was so honored. He got up in the morning and he went out with these Aboriginal hunters and he felt really one of them. And he was going to learn something new with a boomerang and a spear. And maybe, you know, they were putting, what they put, they put little locusts in the, you know, between their bottoms, don't they? Because that's their only, it's their only pocket in their body. And uh, he felt really honored. And they went out in a truck and they were driving along out to the desert. And he was very excited. And there was a kangaroo came along and they just put their foot on the accelerator and charged at the kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot to be said for it. <laughs> because <laughs> sometimes you might miss the kangaroo, but you can either go through a series of methods or you can really just head for the kangaroo. <laughs> And it'll be a car crash, probably, and you may dent your, your car. And I'm not interested in killing kangaroos, but, they, but you, you have to sort of smash up against the thing to see what will happen. And then when you, you know, stand there reeling or you've fallen flat in your face, you, you spend a lot of time picking up the pieces and seeing what's left. So you do charge at it. Uh, I mean, the only way to get to anything is to go there and not, there's no safe way of going there and there's certainly no glamorous way of going there. The lack of glamour in rehearsing, uh, we've got, a, we get sponsors every now and then and they all ask and they come in and sit in and, and watch your rehearsal and they sit in and within about an hour they're glazing over with boredom. <laughs> not because we're discussing it but because we're doing it again and again and again and again, the same little bit that because sometimes if you don't get that little bit right you can't get the next bit right and it's also very important that the director own every second of the evening without having prescribed hardly any second of the evening. Because it's in tiny units. The audience don't need to know this, but it is. It's in tiny bits. And, the, and when, if you always move that on, you know, on, the, on the word mud, then if you don't move it in the word mud, mud, you screw up that bit. 
for everybody else. So if you get used to always saying mud, and that's there, then the next bit will always follow mud. If, so if the director knows that, they can say on a Thursday, why don't we try moving the microphone first and then saying mud, mud. And then you can literally shift the music of the evening. But the director must hold that. And so the quality of watching by a director has to be very, very astute and very total and very humble and very, um, just very generous. And actually, often, the best notes for an actor is when you hear a director giving another actor a note because you respect it. And you hear them saying, you know, when you come through that door, it's much better if you sit down on arrival. And you think, yeah, I've been so annoyed by that guy coming through that door and standing there. <laughs> and the moment the director says a thing that makes you comfortable, you think that director can see it and feel it. And once you know that, you're more likely to go up and say, can I come in the door and not sit down? <laughs> uh, can I come in the door and do something else? Because you know that they know that it's right or wrong. And really, all I think art is, is clearing away, which is very near Michelangelo's notion of the statue. You're clearing away what's wrong so that what's right and brilliant can shine through. I think that's a beautiful note to finish on. Right. So can I...